Hello, welcome to the world premiere of The Accidental Activist. I'm your host, the serious blonde, Shanda Masta. Please say hello to my special guest co-host, the host of A Brave New Future and the ever amazing wordsmith, Amber King. Hi, and, how are you doing? And the all-knowing and all-powerful man behind the curtain and my producer, Oz Lefebvre. Hi, guys. How you doing? Hi, guys. So, uh, let's see. I just don't want to roll right into it. So I wanted to give you guys a chance to, you know, say your highs or put anything out there you guys want to say. Amber. Yes, Happy yeah, I was just going to say it's a beautiful uh, sunny afternoon here, evening in uh, beautiful Pacific Northwest. I hope everybody is tending to their gardens and growing food for their neighbors or talking about it. I did want to give a shout out. There's an amazing app out there that a family mine, family member of mine helped uh, create and produce. It's called Plenty, P-L-E-N-T-I. And it is a free app. You can find it like Android, Apple. I don't know if he's got F-Droid yet, but thumbs up on F-Droid. And it, when your garden is too large or you have more to share, you can use this app to put up what you have plenty of and share with your neighbors. So it's a socially minded mutual aid app. That is awesome. That's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Oz, you got anything to share? Well, my uh, my words of wisdom are going to be parsed quite carefully tonight because I've got Achilles behind me. He's ready to shove that sword <laughs> through my head. So that's all I got going. But I'm uh, I'm here to uh, help christen this wonderful program that you've put together and uh, break a leg. I, I think uh, it's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your time and your energy. And I just want to give a special thanks to the fam at Uphill Media check out the incredible talent all of the great shows that are on they're so diverse there's so much energy check it out uphill media anywhere that you look for your usual um, media platforms so today's show is going to be a little bit different than what my platform would normally be so the accidental activist platform what i envision for the show in the future is going to be uh, finding those unsung heroes, my cat is co-hosting right now, finding those unsung heroes of our progressive movement, moving around this movement for the last five years. I've met so many incredible people that have done incredible things for years beyond the movement. And those are the people we want to find. Those are the people we want to talk to. I, I feel that we learn so much knowledge from, you know, everybody's collective knowledge. And so I'm going to ask for your help you know, to find these people. But first, I feel like I have to tell you my story and how I became an accidental activist. So today I've got I've got a nice little slideshow set up for you guys and uh, quite a few uh, stories to tell. So we're going to go ahead and roll into the first one. Oh, so that's I think it's number two. There you go. Are you guys ready to take a wild ride in the time machine back to the DNC 2016? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm way ready. <laughs> way ready. Uh, I'll I'll put my nightmares aside. Mm, and just don't let say back to the future. To. We don't need any more of that. So this is this is what happened, right? Not where this we're going. Right. And you know, I, I was I was reading an article the other day and it was some of the newer people that applied to be Bernie delegates for the 2020 race. And they were so completely heartbroken and shocked that they were going to be vetted by the state parties and potentially the DNC for anything they said or did on their page. And I just thought, you know, so many people don't know what we went through in 2016. So I, I feel like it's so important just to revisit it because I don't think people understand what these the delegates and what the people that went to Philadelphia actually went through. The media did an excellent job of suppressing it and pretty much wiping it from history. So you can see in my first video here, this is the CD6 caucus and the state Washington State Convention. So I was a single mother with three kids. I, you know, had kids young. I uh, worked minimum wage jobs, no health insurance, um, st stood in food bake lines plenty of times in my life. And, uh, you know, when Bernie ran in 2000, well, about 2015, August, I joined the Chalk the Block 
campaign, which was we just went around and we drew Bernie on sidewalk, you know, with sidewalk chalk. Didn't matter anywhere you jogged, anywhere, you know, people could see it. And a lot of people didn't know who Bernie was. You know, August 2015, we, we've seen the infamous picture of his, you know, announcing and there's only a handful of people there. And you flash forward even six months later and we saw those huge rallies. So I got excited and I, I started really looking into Bernie's platform and everything that I as a single mother with three grandkids was needed, it was talked about in Bernie's platform. And no other politician in the country was talking about these things, you know, universal health care. I never had health care. If my kids got sick, it was echinacea, you know, <laughs> um, college free tuition. You know, I went to I went back to school. I bartended at night and I went to school during the day. It cost me a ton of money and I was exhausted. I came out of there, you know, with the what? Maybe a dollar more an hour. So I uh, I volunteered to become a caucus site precinct manager and I didn't know what that was. I had no idea. I took a couple of hour training on the telephone the night before my caucus. I had never been to a caucus. I wasn't a political person. <laughs> my cat wants to have his say <laughs> so sorry about the bouncy computer so i uh, went to my caucus and i'll never forget it it was a march day it was beautiful 75 degrees so sunny and hundreds of people in my community in my little tiny community had turned up at our elementary school and they were lined up down the block and they were so excited for bernie and there was all these you know, a few, a few handful of Democrats, I guess, is, that were supposed to be organizing this caucus. I don't, they didn't know what was coming. They didn't realize that many people would show up. So, you know, basically we spent eight hours locked in hallways because they didn't even open the rooms for us. People needed to get back to work. It, it was, it was trying. And finally we got our votes and we got our delegates and I was elected a delegate. And at that time I, you know, I said, well, I'll go to the state level. I, I don't know what that means, you know, but I was willing to represent. So the next day I just jumped in both feet, you know, no looking back. I needed to figure this out. How do I represent Bernie in the best way possible and implement these changes and fight for these policies that are so desperately needed in our country? So I immediately contacted what I was told to do was contact the legislative Dems and get a list of our delegates. So I did that. And I was told you can't have a list of the delegates. <laughs> you can't, you know, you don't know because we wanted to organize. We didn't want to, you know, go in there blind, not knowing each other. Maybe we could carpool, that type of thing. And because we knew we had to fundraise, even going into a state convention costs hundreds of dollars. I was lucky I got the VIP pass just because I had donors that wanted to see me, you know, be able to be in all of the events. So that I, it was a couple hundred dollars just to go to the state convention, if I remember right. Is that right, Amber? Oh, honey, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I don't remember paying. Um, I... I did go. Um, I was not. I did not go for a delegate because the congressional district level. I already had a conflict that I had committed to in like January. Um, but for the um, legislative district caucuses, I did. I brought my whole family. I brought my kids. We sat in a hot, crowded gymnasium for hours. They were starving. There was no food. <laughs> you know, no food. it wasn't. I know people had way worse experiences, they though. Did. They did. Um, and especially into the, you know, county county conventions as well. I, I did attend all of them. I did become a PCO after that. Um, but I don't remember. I might have paid. I don't, I don't know. It was four years ago. Right. Um, I, well, you, you could get in to the just the regular convention part which was boy if you remember remember the booing of uh, Merkley and um, it was just so loud and chaotic there was thousands there was over a thousand of us crammed in that convention and, and what an exciting time because you know for the first time the power of the people was in that room and, and a lot of us knew it but we didn't understand parliamentary procedure you know we didn't understand how it all worked we were all wet behind the ears but we still were trying and we had strategies and i remember there was a strategy to remove jackson ravens we had wrote a um a revision to the amendment an, an amendment 
anyways, and the young man who had presented it was threatened right before my eyes. If you go forward with this progressive amendment, we're going to strip you of your credentials and you won't go to Philadelphia. And that was the first time I'd ever like, whoa, you know, like, that's not very American like, you know, <laughs> like that's shocking that, you know. And so from there, it was just a shocking eye opener, you know, because I had always been a, a vote blue. I voted for Clinton in 92. You know, I, vo I voted for Gore. I had always just fallen in line, but I didn't realize that I was voting against my own best interests all of those years. You know, I, I was voting to kick myself off of programs and, and you know, <laughs> cut my own feet off. And so, you know, the state convention was an eye opener. The caucuses not being allowed to have Bernie signs, not being allowed to talk about Bernie. You know, we were real hushed and shushed. And I remember one time we were in a, a county meeting and uh, we were fighting over the superdelegates. We wanted a resolution that said the superdelegates didn't count. You know, let's cast their votes up. And um they pulled out a amendment that they wrote in August of 2015. Now, very few people know what happened in August of 2015. Hillary campaign held a boot camp where they went through the bylaws and they revised anything they thought we could weaponize against them, including that one. And so they literally pulled out a little slip of paper and it had August 2015 on it. You know, it was just so shocking. Like, <laughs> how dare they? And it was a real eye opener to have, you know, our state committee woman tell me, you know, I, I said, my my I'm here to fight for my grandchildren. They can't drink oil. And she said, we're addicted to oil. Get over it. And I was like, did I go to the Republicans? Where am I? You know, am I in the wrong place? So th that was the first, my first intro into the Democratic Party. Oh, man. What a nightmare. I'm so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right? I'm sorry. Yeah. And I didn't even talk about the nastiness and the rudeness. You know, you guys know how that is. So, so this, this is, is starting your evolution of becoming the accidental activist, right? This That's, is my and, evolution. And you're, you're like, I wasn't an activist. I, I was just a working mom who, you know, occasionally turned on MSNBC and liked what Rachel Meadows had to say and, <laughs> you know, watched CNN for 20 years. I had no clue. I, you know, I always knew that there was a level of propaganda. I just didn't realize how much of it I was ingested. Yeah. And, and now that we find out that uh, media, I think Chomsky said it, is their, their role is to manufacture consent. As we've all seen, like you've got quite a few people in the room right now, um, it, it, it's all propagandized. If uh, they don't manufacture consent, they lose their job, you know, i.e. Ed Schultz, Phil Donahue, and the rest. So... Um, uh, yeah, it's, we, yeah, yeah, it, that's where it's at. So this is this is this is cool, um, Shanda, because you're giving people a bird's eye perspective as what what your wake up call was yes. uh, starting from 2016. So please, please continue. OK, you want to go ahead and flip us to the next slide? There you go. Next slide. OK, the next slide is called the journey for Bernie. Now, there was multiple journeys for Bernie. It's a term that gets thrown around the movement a lot, you know, but we were an actual journey that came together. There was 25 strangers in Seattle. We planned this out for weeks and we all met up at the Safeco field and we packed into seven vans and we headed out across country. Our plan was to drive straight through three days, just trading off drivers. And then we were gonna camp in a old uh, a camp in New Jersey called Parvin State Park. And so literally you take 25 alpha organizers and you shove them into seven vans and they don't know each other. You got conflicting personalities. I got to go to the bathroom. One girl packed her whole house and brought it with her. So every time we'd stop, we'd have to rearrange everything. It was the most insane road trip I've ever taken in my life. <laughs> it was hot. It was stinky. There was no showers. We were exhausted. Mm. We were overdrive and the whole way the WikiLeaks emails had dropped. I mean, literally 24 hours on the road, the first email had dropped. Huh. And we knew Seth Rich had been killed a week before we left. Mm -hmm. Somebody was trying to talk. So 
as we are moving across the country, we're losing people. We had a van breakdown. We had the most profound thing to me about that trip was, um, you know, I, I crossed the Columbia River in central Washington, like I always have my whole entire life. But the water level had fallen about 20, 30 feet from the last time I had passed it just a few years earlier. It was like a punch in the gut, like, <gasps> where'd all our water go? <laughs> you know, our water's gone. And then when we got to the Rocky Mountains, I couldn't see the Rockies on a clear day because of the fracking haze. And then we get to Chicago and the only thing holding up the rusty um, overpasses that are falling out of the skies is the amount of homeless under them. So I, I got a firsthand look at what was going on in our country, you know, and our vans are decked out. They say never Hillary, Bernie or bust, you know, Philly or bust. And so we drew a lot of attention everywhere we went. I mean, we even had the Hells Angels circle us at one point. <laughs> but so we talked to a lot of people. I mean, we talked to a lot of people across the country. And yeah, there was a lot that were for Hillary. But I was shocked at the amount of Republicans that came out to us and said, oh, hey, I like Bernie. You know, I'm going to vote for Trump. But if Trump wasn't around, I'd, I'd support Bernie, which was kind of shocking to me to realize, hey, we really do have so much more in common with, you know, our fellow citizens. So now we arrive, we're a day late because we had somebody break down. I was scheduled to do the People's Convention with Nina Turner, which I was so heartbroken I didn't get to do that because that was the only thing I was just like, I get to go meet Nina Turner. So we pull in and this is the exact time that Debbie Washington Schultz is, has resigned or been fired, whatever you want to call it, got her new job with Hillary. And we're thinking, oh, my gosh, these emails are going to blow what we already knew wide open. The whole country is going to find out how the Dems have been cheating, you know, and we watched it from caucus to caucus to convention, them stuff in ballot boxes, them pulling ballots out, you know, oh, you don't need these absentee ballots. Um, you know, we saw purging of the rolls. We saw provisional ballots. You know, what didn't we see? Election fraud everywhere. But we're not allowed to say election fraud because that makes us poor sports and bad losers. So we get there and there's thousands, there's thousands of people on the fence of the DNC. And let me tell you, they had two fences. It was crazy. I'll show you the pictures in the next slide if you want to move to the next slide. Thank you. Oh, that's the journey leaving. There you go. Thank you. Oh, you can put both up. That's pretty cool. Uh, what slide are we on? Five. Five. Okay. That's your warm welcome, right? Yeah. Does it say warm welcome on it? Yeah, it does. Okay. So warm welcome of the DNC. So you see, as you can see, we were met by gates and cops and helicopters. We had three helicopters at all times swarming, you know, just right above our heads. It's not like they were way up there. They were right over our heads. And you know, that was for a reason, because there was so many of us. And CNN did not report this. MSNBC didn't no, report didn't. it. Fox maybe a little bit. But there was over 100,000 of us in Philadelphia. And we had different protests and we had different rallies scheduled. I mean, we literally had four days of events scheduled, right, from... It was called FYI Philly, which organized a lot of these. They went and they got all the permits and then they just let groups have these. So we had a schedule, you know, every day of what we were going to go hit. Our delegates were there. We were in communication with our delegates the whole time, you know, especially the ones that were from our states. So we knew what was going on in the inside, which we're going to get to that. And let me tell you, that was a bad one. And let's see what is the next slide is Jimmy Dore and we you. are the media. Yeah, Jimmy Dore. Thank you. Tim Black. So we can't. knowing that they were not reporting what was actually going on there, you know, the amount of police bus after bus after bus of police officers was there. We would just watch them come in, come in, come in, come in. And they would just circle us. I mean, they were everywhere. They were 30 deep behind that that picture of that fence. And, and so, you know, we were not rowdy. We're burners, man. We're love. We're happiness. We're kumbaya and let's sing in the revolution types. So it was just uncalled for. It was unwarranted. Warranted. But if you remember, they had threatened us with that prison. Remember, they had refurbished a, a prison just outside of Philadelphia to hold us all in if we were going to get rowdy, even though they never did. They threatened us with that. So, uh, 
we knew we had to be the media. I went in, we were the media one team. Uh, we had, you know, somewhat of press credentials that we could get into a few places. I, I was fortunate. I got to meet a lot of the independent media that we know and love so well. Jimmy Dore, Lee Camp, Tim Black. I actually got to go live with Tim Black during a Cornell West speech, which was incredible. But the whole time it's 105 degrees out and, and you know, we're camping two hours away. So it's not like I'm, I'm barely getting makeup on, you know, I'm, I'm melting basically every day. It, it was, it was, and then we were staying there, you know, very late. So for the first night, uh, I think we'd go back about two or three o'clock in the morning to the campsite, maybe sleep for a couple hours and then get back up and drive back in. And we were on the Jersey turnpike. Wow. So I, you know, I absolutely love America, you know, counting the cars on the Jersey turnpike. That's what we were doing. We were looking for America. And finally, after the first day, and we saw the way that the DNC was treating our delegates, we decided we were going to occupy FDR Park. So literally, I just started dumping stuff out of our camping gear. Like, I don't need this stove anymore. And I don't need this lamp anymore. <laughs> and we just went and we took our tent and we set it up. Literally, I was 50 feet away from the DNC gate. And that's where I slept for three days with helicopters over my head, showering in a hose in the middle of FDR Park, <laughs> all for Bernie and all for our issues. So this next one, you can see, you know, there's a lot of protesting going on. There's Jill Stein. I love that little boy that says, look, mom, no future. And then there's the DNC casket. You know, uh, we had a drive to gather up Dem Exit, basically, is what it was. It was Dem Exit. And that coffin was filled with people's uh, supposedly Dem registration cards. You know, Washington, it's a state of mind. But so at the end, you know, after two or three days, they took that coffin and they threw it <laughs> over the fence into the DNC. And we got a great little slide video that's coming up that will show you a lot of the arrests and um, protest and actions that were happening that you didn't get to see anywhere else that have been suppressed on social media. So what slide I, number is that? This this is seven. You want to the one with Kashama, eight? Yes. I, I watched a lot of this live feed, not only of the convention, but followed everybody who were delegates very, very closely so we could continue to keep supporting them. What do they need? Where are you guys at? Um, it was it was like it was like a crazy ride sitting at home still, you know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, thank it, you though. That was so important that our delegates felt supported because they were so mistreated inside the convention center. They were spit on. They were pushed. Their signs were ripped out of their hands. They had white noise piped in over them. Their seats were sold for $50 to a seat filler with a Hillary shirt on. You know, um, they turned the they, lights out on them. They shut the lights out on them. Then when that didn't work, they put these plastic signs over yeah, them. We so saw you that. couldn't see their shirts. You yeah, know? that was, yeah. You guys had the lime green shirts on. They all, yes. they all came back with the glow in the dark shirts yeah. and said, turn the lights out again. Yeah. Yep. And that's when they held up these Orwellian signs and they piped them in how to hold up your sign just perfect. So that way they couldn't see anybody in the crowd. It's just disgusting. They it's did that right in front disgusting. of you guys. They they instructed him right in front of you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. It piped and we in watched over it. the loudspeaker. It piped in over the loudspeaker. That's, that's unity. That's DNC unity, right? <laughs> right. I, right. I, I, I honestly, I still have creepy memories of like the balloon. Uh, I mean. <laughs> oh, Hillary when she was. Well, yeah. and, and Bill. like And Bill, was yeah. So it was pretty, just, pretty, pretty sickening. Pretty it was sickening. so disgusting. Well, and to be on the outside of that, you know, our delegates, I, I had one delegate come find me. I was uptown at some rally and she came running up to me and she was just crying, just bawling her eyes out and she's like we need you to get downtown we need everybody there to protect the delegates you know and she's just crying and telling me what they're doing but you know they wouldn't i was a super volunteer i should have been on the inside of the convention but oh hell no they were not going to let radicals no. like bernie or bus in so we were just ignored even though the campaign told us ahead of time oh yeah you're signed up you'll get in you know here's your credentials yeah, no, the DNC said, no, go away. And, I, so, and I'm curious how that's going to play out this year, honestly. Me too. We can talk about that later. But. Yeah, I think it's we're going to have the same issues. And yeah. so um, 
So the delegates walk out. What most people don't realize about the delegates walk out is it was planned. There was a group of us that knew, you know, how the DNC was going to treat us. We knew going in that Bernie was going to be robbed one way or another. So we started secretly vetting delegates and I would contact them about a month ahead of time. I'd start filling them out, see if they're, you know, pretty Bernie or bust or, you know, will they tow the establishment line? Because if if we got found out, they would strip the credentials from the delegates that we had talked to. So we had to be very careful that, you know, we didn't expose them or put them in a position that they could lose their spots. So we had, you know, let them know that, hey, if Bernie, you know, gives over his delegates or, you know, the DNC doesn't allow your vote, you know, we're going to stand up and we're going to unify and you guys are going to walk out. And so we had a rally planned for the last night for the delegates walk out. It was called the, you know, we need a new party of the 99. And we had Shama Sawant and um, Pam Keeley and oh, so many other great speakers lined up. You know, we were ready for them. But the delegates got so upset so quick with everything that was going on. They just walked out the first night. <laughs> they were like, oh, we can't wait. So there was multiple delegate walkouts that actually happened during the convention. And so um, the delegate walkout that, you know, we did the rally for was at the very end, the very last night, they would not let them out of the convention center. They would not let them out because they didn't want them to go talk to the press is what it was. They wanted the press to be all gone. They literally released our delegates at like almost one o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the morning. And the convention had been over since like 930 or something. So that was just, you know, I look back at it now and it was like, we knew, we knew, how did we expect it to be any different? So unless you guys want to give a little commentary on this, uh, I, I got about want, five I just, minutes. I just want to say that uh, Kashama Sawant told everybody, and uh, actually Christopher Hedges did too, that there was no way that the Democratic leadership was going to give Bernie this one either. She said it. Yeah. In 2017, there, it was just pointless, you know, that they, they will never give up the party to the likes of a Bernie Sanders. And we're finding out more and more how many infiltrators were in the Sanders campaign this time around and that Bernie was just listening to them. They were, you know, they were from think tanks, Center for American Progress. I mean, if we would have known this going into the primary, I think the whole dichotomy of everything would have changed a little bit. Don't you? Don't you guys think it would have if we would have known that they had did these, know. these pieces? We did know. Well, I knew Jeff Weaver was shady. We knew when he tried to get our rev in a super PAC and half of their board resigned, you know, what, two and a half, three years ago. But we didn't know the extent. I really yeah. didn't know how. I was hopeful. Many. And that's the last time I'm ever going to be hopeful with anything that has to do with the DNC or the Democratic Party. There's yeah. a great conversation going on in the chat too. If if uh, we hi everybody. Oh wow, look at you guys going. Yeah, they're they're going after it. And uh, Jilly's saying, you know, there's no <laughs> it's no point with the Democratic Party. So um, yeah, right. I, and so we're gonna get into what I did about that. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's do. Amber, did you want to add to what I was saying about anything? I, yeah, I mean, it, it it's a hard spot. I mean, where where else were we going to get enough exposure and kind of like how we're still campaigning for Bernie Sanders, how we're still filling seats, how we're still encouraging people to run is if you can keep can pushing, pushing the agenda, pushing the issues. Because it's not pushing, about Bernie. It's about yeah, the issues. It's not about him. And we can be upset at him. We can be sad at his choices. We can be distrustful. But at the end of the day, it's still me. It's still my belief system. It's still my kids that pay the price for this. Yep. And no matter what inside, outside things I do, I still find people still believe that to their core. So until the people stop believing that is when I personally will stop. And, and, and it's, it's always been about us. It's been out, you know, we need not one Bernie Sanders. We need 5 million Bernie Sanders. And until there's 5 million of us in office, in all levels of government, making the policy, it's not going to have the impact that we 
we're hopeful for. And, you know, we are the leaders we've been looking for. You know, we look to these heroes within the progressive movement, but it, it's us. It's everyday people. Our, our government is not some alien being over us. We are the people of this government. We need to get in there and change it. And yeah, I, I still support an inside out, you know, on both. I support everything that everybody's doing progressive to fight for the, our issues, for our platform in the dim party in the green party in a new party the people's party you know the workers movement party the progressive vermont party doesn't you know if you're fighting for the issues then i support you you can't let down on on any of these fronts and like right now we are citizens journalists in media and once this pandemic settles down if it does we're going to be out on the street doing it as well and i know <laughs> shanda right. you're going to be right there with amber and the rest of them while oz is going to be sitting in his ivory tower <laughs> um <laughs> making sure that i'm doing the logistics and transition um shanda do you want to narrate this piece while i kick it over yeah yeah go ahead and kick okay. it on give us give us a little preface on this Okay, so this was uh, created by Evan K. Duke. He was my Journey for Bernie mate. And he, uh, Evan's an amazing activist in his own right. I'm hoping to have bring him on the show and hear his story someday. But uh, he compiled this and it really shows what the mainstream media did not show. It's called Three Days on the Gates of the Oligarch. And, you know, there was multiple arrests. The the cops pepper sprayed us. They used stingrays on us. They herded us around with those helicopters. They wouldn't let our, our protest groups come together, you know, because then we would have had the power. And we did actually come together the very last night. And uh, there's the infamous gate. I was at that gate when it got busted open. Oh, there's the coffin of the dim exit. These are our delegates being silenced. This is the Socialist Party march, and I believe the red flags. More rests. Very heated exchanges on the streets between, you know, the Hillary supporters so many young people it, it's so in you know inspiring i believe that's jill stein's campaign manager going over the fence because of course they wouldn't let jill anywhere near so what they were doing is they would arrest these people and um they wouldn't formally charge them they they had a big bus that they would set you on in with those little plastic hand ties and and you would sit there probably eight ten hours And then they would just kick you loose at the end of the day. But, you know, mind you, it was 104 degrees with no water and no bathrooms. So, yeah, there was some arrests. This was when we tried to take the overpass. I'd say probably a couple thousand of us came together and we were marching. We were going to go take the main overpass, the main interstate in Philadelphia. And the cops just swarmed us. They came at us military style. It it was the scariest thing to be in the middle of, man. You're running for your life when a line of, you know, a couple hundred cops are coming towards you. They tend to like bridges, don't they? Yeah. They got right under the bridge and came at us. You're right. But the energy is like nothing I've ever felt in my life. That much love and that much camaraderie of so many people wanting the same objective we saw nothing of this on mainstream media absolutely no. nothing no, no, um no. this 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 shouldn't shock anybody who's watching because they've been suppressing this uh for decades now it's just like when they wouldn't show the body bags coming back from war that they yep. did in vietnam they learned from that because that's they us don't, sitting they, on the ground while yeah. the cops were coming at us because we just sat down you look know at, when a bunch of cops are coming at you what it's are you amazing. gonna do we just sat look at all those people yeah and those there's, are all the, cops. there's the brown shirts right there but yeah, i gotta say the police were very very kind they you know a lot of them would just say hey man i'm just i'm there with you that's when the gate got open i'm in that picture but probably a row back they were pepper spraying us how did that taste <laughs> well i had a bandana that was wetted down on so what was this the police were riding their bikes through there yeah they almost oh, took yeah. my husband out with their bike <clears throat> i had to push him 
Because that cop was just going to run him over. Wow. Wow. Just wow. Yeah, they had no no dis no regard. And we and that all way. we saw was civility and good feelings and yay Hillary. Oh, the glass ceiling's going to be yeah, shattered. The glass ceiling. Meanwhile, outside, the real progressive populists are getting uh, crapped on. Hi, cat again. <laughs> what was burning there? That was a flag, and that was the anarchists. You know, anytime we have a front line oh, yeah. action, yeah. the anarchists show up. The paid but I don't, I don't yeah. hate on the anarchists. I feel like they're a necessary mm -hmm. evil sometimes because they have the courage to do a lot of the things that us peaceful protesters won't do yeah a lot of those are paid insurrection people there it's... was and we had a lot of you know oh my gosh I, you know i haven't even there's so much i haven't even touched on you know we had soros groups there and where the hell those kids get that type of money at you know uh, you, you just look to the funding you look at how a group is funded follow how well the they're money. funded to know if, if where that money's coming from follow the money follow the money how are we doing on time so we you're better fine. move along you're fine, you're fine. Okay. Fine. We're fine. We got all night. If you slide want. number ten. These are these are really important stories, though, and and they're important because a lot of people didn't see them. Um, a lot of people have different ideas about what democracy means in the United States, and and the reality of that is just not true. And so, I I always dem enter with very thick skin and request and require that those joining me under that purview understand what what we're up against this is this is not we're, we're up against the machine no matter yeah. what party you're in you do have to have very thick skin and you know i admire everybody that hangs in there with the democratic party because i have done it for almost the last five years i've been an elected pco for four years now and so that takes me into my next slide which is uh coming home i i came home heartbroken, exhausted, broke, um, in shock at how many of my um, constitutional rights had been um, violated while I was in Philadelphia, especially with the technology they used on us. I mean, they just wipe our phones clean every day. I had so many videos and pictures and messages that would just disappear off my phone. I could literally record my phone, recording my phone and it would disappear. It was the most insane thing. They would just steal your data. I went through something like 20 gigs of data in three days because they would just take it right off your hotspot. So coming home, you know, it was like I was chair of the Clallam County for Bernie, which had morphed into the Clallam Progressive Coalition. We were actually a progressive coalition that was appointed by our local Democratic Party as a committee, as our own separate committee. And so we had organically grown these meetings. And you can see on the bottom of this picture next to my PCO, uh, that was one of our Friday meetings. And every Friday at three o'clock, um, we would just talk all things progressive. And we were actually doing this at our Democratic headquarters because I live in a town that actually has a Democratic headquarters, but one of the very few in Washington state. And, you know, it's a social club. I, I now know that it's a social club, but at the time I thought it was our Democratic headquarters. <laughs> I, I now know that it's different. So, and above that is actually an LD24 meeting in the same year where, you, you could tell the difference, you know, there's nobody Nobody's going there. to be nobody. <laughs> but I, I did what Bernie asked, you know, I, I went into the Democratic Party. I put my thick skin on. I ran for PCO. I went with, you know, probably there was 12 of us that had formed a slate and we had ran to go over our e-board. We were going to take over at our next reorg, which was in December, I want to say. So it was only a few months away. You know, we got our candidate speeches together and, you know, we figured out our platform and and um, I worked for the Dems. I, you know, I volunteered for committees. I, I did so much mind numbing, busy work for them. You know, they didn't have any data. We're supposed to be working for down ballot candidates at that point. And Vote Blue was a joke. It hadn't been updated since 2008. Um, we didn't have the field in the, you know, the van like we do now, but, um, this picture, I love it. Can I leave yet? I, I literally worked for three days at our County fair that year in 2016, but it wasn't, we weren't allowed to have anything Bernie in our booth because it was about Hillary beating Trump at that point. 
And I watched hundreds of people in my county walk by me. Most, you know, a lot of people knew me as a Bernie delegate. You know, where's Bernie? Why is there any Bernie gear? Isn't Bernie a Democrat? You know, <laughs> and the constant, no, Bernie's not a Democrat. It, it was torture. It was absolutely torture to have my beliefs, my ideology, my candidates, everything that I am and I represent constantly crushed and, and you know, browbeaten down. And, but I still... I still did it. I still showed up. I still went to the meetings. I still fought, you know, I wouldn't outright campaign for Hillary, but I wasn't out there, you know, campaigning against her, you know, other than maybe a few bad memes. So the next slide is no dapple. So right around that time was, oh, this is, oh, this is TP, no TTP. I got my slides mixed up. So, uh, of course, we were fighting mm -hmm. the TPP at that point, and uh, these are taken at Rock the TPP. So now I'm not just inside the Democratic Party. I'm starting to morph out. I'm starting to fight for issues. I'm starting to become an activist, and I don't even know it yet. You know, <laughs> I'm just like, well, I, okay, I'm, I'm against this. I'm going to go show up and support these people. And, uh, you know, I don't care what Trump says. Yeah, Trump killed the TPP, but it, it was the pressure from the progressives in this country that shut that down. And, and thank you, everybody who fought against it. Thank you so much. We know what NAFTA did to our country, right? Yep. And, so then, and for anybody who doesn't know, that's Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yes, yeah, and that was Obama's, uh, his potential gift to mm -hmm. the corporations. Uh, to the global elite. Yeah, the global elite. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's terrible. Global. Arma yeah. cartel. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then um, something that most people didn't know about me is uh, I had many knee injuries in the early 2000s. I was a dancer in high school. I blew my knee out and then just repeatedly had problems. And I picked up an opiate habit handed to me by my doctor, a man in a white lab coat that I trusted. You know, he tells me to take these things. I took them. 10 years of that destroyed my life, uh, took everything I had financially, um, emotionally. I, I, I was devastated. I was wrecked. And this was only a few years before, you know, I really woke up and, and started seeing the world for really what it was. And so I, I cleaned up with an all natural al alternative called Kratom. I saw it on the news one day and I was ready to commit suicide. I was ready to just be done. I was so miserable being on Big Pharma. Big Pharma had taken my life from me. They they literally intentionally tried to kill me. <laughs> and I let them and, and I paid them to do it. So um, I got into the fight to try to save Kratom because they were trying to schedule it because the Big Pharma lobbyists did not want us to have a natural alternative. They want us taking their drugs. And uh, as many of you may know now, they've rolled out the MAT program, which is a medical assist treatment. So basically, we're going to swap out one bad drug for another bad drug, but you're cured. And no, this makes lifelong customers. That's all it does. I, I'm I'm not opposed to Matt in the right situations, but I am in a broad form because I just know there's other ways to do it naturally without enriching the global elite. And so, you know, we came home, uh, we did, we held a meeting called the Bernie and beyond and uh, that we sat down, we brought five delegates onto a panel and we let them tell their stories. You know, people that weren't in the convention didn't understand. And I watched grown men cry, cry over their, you know, memories of what the DNC had done to them. So this, we're coming into um, the People Summit. Oh, no dapple. Okay, now we're in the no dapple. So now Standing Rock starts, you know, we, we knew about no dapple going in, but this is when it started to really heat up. And so a lot of my uh, travel mates from the journey from Bernie just said that's we're going, you know, and so they, we formed networks to help people get there. We formed networks to send food, clothes, um, phone equipments. I sent battery packs, you know, because they were using the same technology at Standing Rock that they were using in Philadelphia, which is those damn stingrays. And so it's hard to get communications out when your phone's overheating, shutting down, can't catch a signal. You know, they just block the signal. Your phone connects to it thinking it's a cell phone and they can do whatever they want to your phone. And at that same time, you know, I knew that we needed a new party. So I actively started looking for and supporting 
all of these different parties because now I had this big progressive committee that needed to figure out where to go. There was a lot of people that didn't want to go back in the dims and I felt like I owed them an answer where they should go organize. And so we met with Nick, Brianna, the the people's movement for your you know, movement for people's party and at that time we were called Draft Bernie, right? And so uh, and at the same time, we had the party for us and we had the progressive independent party with Eric Wellblas, who was another one of my campmates in Philadelphia, another great organizer in her own right. You know, we're all working for the same goal, it seems like. Right. We all have different outlets for it, but ultimately we all want the same thing in the end. And so we uh, we went into the People Summit. I think that is my next slide. You want to give me the next one? Yeah. The People Summit in Chicago, 2017. So we uh, we went there with kind of an agenda. We knew Bernie was going to be there, but we wanted to pressure Bernie into, you know, forming a people's party. So draft Bernie was there in force and uh, the nurses union, Roseanne DeMara was, you know, um, one of the commentators that night. I love Roseanne and, DeMara. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know you love she, Roseanne. She's, awesome. she's amazing. So that was the night she told Bernie, you know, heroes are cornered. They're not created or something like that. But basically we needed to corner Bernie and, and push him to lead a new party. And, you know, this famous picture in the middle with Bernie standing in front of us. I'm in that picture. And <laughs> you can see Jimmy was there and Tim Black was there. And so many of our great independent media was there. We no, got Mickey, Nina, no, no Mickey there. No Mickey yeah. and Jordan. And uh, just so many, I got to, I got to talk with Naomi Klein. I mean, I, it's so amazing when you get to talk to somebody like that for a few minutes, you know, and just hear what they're thinking about something. But the main thing I came away from the people summit with was Bernie was not going to leave the Democrats. Bernie was going to run again. I knew that in 2017, I knew by the way he was laying out his book and his, you know, book tour, it just looked like a presidential run. So I was like, OK, I'll suck it up and stay in the Democratic Party just for Bernie, just for Bernie. That way, I, you know, I can be there to help him fight in 2020 when he runs. So I kind of le I didn't I left draft Bernie, but I've always supported them. And that's why we moved on to the party for us and uh, great organizers there. Um, Bayou was incredible. Some of you, I'm sure, knew her and she passed on, which I'm hoping we can do a segment in this show about the lost heroes of the movement. There's been yeah. so many incredible people that we've lost in this movement that I want to pay honor to and play tribute to, you know, that supported us, that, that helped me rise. So, um, yes. Yeah, so let's see what else is in that picture. It's so small. I can't see it. Well, you got uh, Lancelot I, there, and uh, yeah, I'm just trying to see what was in that picture. Oh, John Lancelot, the real progressives. You know, I had never spoke before a crowd until the my caucus. You know, like I remember being nervous and what am I going to say? You know, that type of thing. And uh, that was the first show I ever did was the real progressives. You know, so I'm sure many of you know John Lancelot and Steve Grumbine, and I think he has uh, a different one now, but. Uh, they were incredible and in letting me tell my story of how, you know, I had felt I had been wronged by the Democratic Party. <laughs> and so that was my first taste of being in front of a camera. Yeah. Well, I, I want to I want to just jump in here. Yeah, I want everybody to know Shanda is not one of these people that just go to places to get photo ops. She's actually in the field. She's our citizens journalist. She has evolved herself into the accidental activist. And she's like many of us. We're going to go out swinging. Now, we supported Bernie and we have a different view on things now. Sure, Bernie started it. but We're going to finish it. And it's no need in looking back because that's not the direction we're going. We're going forward. And this is what we need with people like you and Amber and Rhonda and, and everybody at Uphill and all these other social media outlets. I just wanted to make people sure people are clear. You're not a groupie chasing these social media people around. There's no point to that. That does no good for us. You're out there doing the journals like Fiorella, Isabella, you know, and Pasta and everybody else. We need Jordan Cheriton. All of you guys are out there and we're right. a network. We can't leave any stone unturned. So continue. Yeah, please. I don't really consider myself a 
journalist. I mean, I've done journalism. You are. In my You're life, drafted. But <laughs> You're I, drafted. I, networking. I think the most important thing we can do is network. So that way, when Amber says, "Hey, I need somebody to blah blah blah," I'm like, "Oh, I know the perfect person." You know, I, I just feel like that's how we build this movement: is knowing each other and knowing who's out there doing what, and and how we can support them. And and Jilly, I agree with you. Cynthia is amazing. I would support her too. <laughs> Cynthia McKinney. Oh yeah. Put a put a bug in her ear. Let's do this. Yeah. I mean, I, I know poor thing. She's hiding overseas somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens when you speak truth to power. You yeah. have to change your address and move to another country. Yeah. Yep. I, I I I know personally. I've been on mini lists for a long time fighting <laughs> fighting <laughs> the chemical cartel. So <laughs> the last I, time I flew was real fun. Yeah. I I have nothing nothing to take but these hands. So bring it. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I, I have no assets. I you want my debt? All yours, baby. Next yeah. slide. Is we on the next slide? Fourteen. The next slide. Fourteen. There we go. Oh More my activism. God! Look at that. You made a magazine. You're a cover girl. Yeah. So then I just started jumping in around this time. I got hired to manage a 502 store. And what that means in Washington state was that was the amendment that made marijuana legal in our state. And so I managed a store just as soon as it was legal. And I had no experience other than management experience, but I had no cannabis experience. So I jumped right in. I actually went to school to learn about medical marijuana, not just, hey, let's get high. But how do we treat people and how do we cure cancer with marijuana and CBDs? And um, I've seen some incredible stories in the marijuana industry. I was lucky enough to, um, to, to be friends with some very cool activists within the cannabis uh, industry that have been fighting for many, many years. They took me in. They taught me the trade. And so I got a taste of that. And then you know, issues, 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 um, whole Washington, you see me down there on the steps of our Capitol. And, uh, you know, I had never spoke in front of a crowd like that. I, I, I remember shaking when I picked up the mic that time and I just started embracing anything that I could fight for that was on our platform. And then the other one is a picture of some very incredible activists at, um, Oh, I want to say it's no, uh, nuclear us anyway they're trying to stop the mining of uranium and, and what it's doing to I, I mean people don't even realize what we are doing how we're getting this uranium and who we're using to get it we're using native populations we're stealing their land and you know it, it's it's and honeywell and these other corporations right that there. are you know it, they are our weapons developers that mm -hmm. so many of us have 401ks invested in you know, divest. That was my biggest push in the, that year was divest. Divest. Yep. Get your money away from these guys. Quit letting them use it, you know. And that and that started with the TTP. I, I did. was very, very active in all these things that the Canon nurses also. I do want to give a huge shout out to uh, my former classmate, David Tran, who started Dope Magazine. Oh. Um, because he had this great um, speaking of of accidental activists had a awesome uh, Facebook post I saw the other day saying release nonviolent cannabis offenders. And I for those that. of us who are not in states with legal um, medical marijuana and marijuana in general, um, which we're hoping to change, um, that they are deemed essential workers, um, but not by everyone because we still right. have hundreds and thousands of inmates in for um, ridiculous crimes. And so yeah. until that is fixed, Absolutely. You know, yep. they're they're not essential yet. They're just making money off them. Well, yeah, they, right. they need and, that and prison. The, and all the people that are working in the cannabis industry right now, you know, those stars stayed open. And I know many that are scared for their lives right now, oh, but yeah. they're still showing up. Yeah. Yeah. Still showing and, up. and they do that because, you know, they they found medicine that worked when pharmaceuticals didn't work. Um, I've I've had amazing treatment from from cannabis stores with nurses on staff that were able to help me when I had just left an urgent care after having an autoimmune reaction and they weren't able to do anything and wouldn't except for give me pregnisone, which I'm allergic to. I'm like, oh, you didn't, you didn't read that right there where it says I'm allergic. Did you in my right. chart? They never do. They never no. do. I mean, it, it's, it's just been astonishing, but you know, they need to, we need to release these people. We need to help the formerly incarcerated have a life and absolutely. And the nuclear proliferation, of course. 
in all areas. And it is not a green new deal aspect, right? We need to stop promoting that spreading out in tinier, smaller parts is better for us. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, this whole year, so now we're coming into like 2018. I'm just on the go for every issue that we are fighting for, you know, environmental or all of it. I was there. And so this is the border wall fight. We uh, there is always a protest called. uh, Is it um, it's to stop the school of the Americas. I want to say it's so no SOS, no school of the Americas. And it's been going on for years and years, but at this point, they moved it down to Nogales, Arizona, um, to the border wall, because at the same time, you know, that's when Trump, well, come on, Obama was doing it first, you know, it, we can't just blame it on Trump, but it, it seemed to step up. So I, we, I went down there and um, we circled a detention, the Southwest Detention Center, where they are holding the women that they take the children from. And we held a candlelight vigil and we sang to them, no estén solos, which means you are not alone. And they would flick the lights on to let us know that they were there. It was just absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, we are talking in the middle of the desert, drive like two hours in this dirt desert. And then boom, there's this big prison. And there was hostile cops there too. <laughs> like, Very shocking. But um, Veterans for Peace was there. Yay! I mean, I learned so much that I didn't know as an American when I went down there. I did not know what the Border Patrol was doing. I did not know that they were shooting them through the damn fence, that they were killing young boys, you know. It, and the whole like, time, uh, look, Mom, another helicopter. They had a helicopter over our head the whole oh time we gosh. were at the border. <laughs> yeah. I have PTSD now when I hear a helicopter just because I've had so many swarm me the last few years. I don't blame you at all. And to tell you what, that wall, it's just, it's so, so terrible. It's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. So I'm going to move us up a little bit because we've gone a little long on these. I'm trying to keep us somewhat on time. You're doing fine. I will get better about keeping us on time, guys. It's okay. We, We don't want to worry about time when we're talking a couple of minutes either way. It's not a problem. Okay. Go right ahead. Your I'm story is more important. It's so far more person, important than any so. clock. I, I try to be on time. Yeah, that's Okay, fine. so 16 is, look, mom, I'm an activist. Look, mom, you're an <laughs> activist. You are an activist. I didn't realize I was, but. My, yeah. my children say that with a large eye roll. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter did that I to me. them along. Yeah, my daughter did that to me about 10 years ago, and then she just threw her hands up in the air. Okay, dad. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> That's funny. So, you know, just fighting for everything and candidates, you know, we jumped in full force. We fought our Dems. We took our e-board, which I kind of left that part out of the story about fighting the Dems. But in uh, 2016 at the reorg, we actually won a super majority. And the next day they were supposed to uh, give us the keys to the headquarters and give us all the data, you know, the new e-board to the old e-board. And they just locked the doors and told us to take a hike. And from there, it was just a literal war. Like, I I watched our female chair be assaulted by a male e-board member of the Democratic Party. You know, we went to the police and our local police just laughed like, oh, aren't you Democrats cute? All your infighting, you know. So they didn't take it serious. There was attorneys involved and, you know, people uh, throwing Hitler signs and Heil Hitlers. Uh, It was the most insane thing I've ever seen. Just the dysfunction and the breakdown of, of being civil at all in these Democratic meetings. So at that point, uh, we voted to dim exit as a committee, the the progressively appointed committee of the Democratic Party in Clallam County, unanimously, I believe we had one abstention that to to leave. And so at that point, we became the Olympic Peninsula progressives. And that's what we are now. And that's what we've remained. And that way, you know, we can still work on issues. We can get behind candidates, but we don't have to bow to the Democratic Party because it was always a fight for everything. If we wanted to even make a flyer, you got to put the donkey on it. Well, I'm sorry, in 2017, that branding turned people off. And and we're trying to get people involved. We're like, no, let's not put anything, you know. We don't need that donkey on there. It It was just an example of the type of, you know, wall brick wall that we literally would come up against every time i mean resolutions platforms amendments it didn't matter they fought us on everything if you told them the sky was blue they would say "Uh uh-uh 
Do you, for for those of uh, people so, listening and watching that aren't um, local, would you like to describe a little bit about where Clallam County is? Kind of, it's yeah, different. I will. So I think Clallam that helps County, frame frame this, right? right? We're a rural county, so Washington State, as most know, is a very blue state. A lot of people like to think we're a progressive state. Uh, we want to be a progressive state, but we're actually a pretty moderate blue state. But we have a lot of rural areas, so we have a lot of Republicans. And I am the furthest northwest point of Washington. So that little tip you see on the top of, of any U.S. map, that that's where I live in Clallam County. So I can see Canada on a clear day most days. Um, we have are, the beautiful Olympic Mountains, the Dungeness River. Are there vampires? <laughs> Only in Forks, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Checking. Yeah. No, we love to go to Forks and look for them. But uh, so, you know, we have we have the environment here that we're trying to protect. We are one of the only places left in the world with original old growth forests and second growth. And, you know, we have beautiful mountain ways and waterways. And I, we're watching it be just annihilated and desolated before our very eyes. And what is not being destroyed is being scooped up by the Navy and annexed and owned. So it, I feel like it won't be long till the Navy owns the Olympic Peninsula. So that's where we are at. And so it's it's a long trek for me to go out and fight. My capital is a two and a half hour drive, long, windy drive one way. So it's an all day thing for me to go to my legislators, which I have done numerous, numerous times. You know, if there's something at the Capitol I need to be at, I, 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 I take the truck. And then Seattle's another two and a half hours away from me, too. So getting into, you know, fight with some of these great groups like, um, uh, socialist alt and shama you know and her groups and everything that tax amazon amber thank you for being out there supporting all of these groups i wish i could be there with you guys i'm so jealous some days when i see like i need to move to seattle <laughs> and then you look at the price of housing and you're like oh, right shit, never mind well, i could never i could never afford to even even get a county closer to seattle well now now you have a place to stay when you come down to the state capital capital you can stay at the yes. land of oz we have a, a nice facility here amber has stayed here herself so Very she good. can tell you all about it very Wait, good. Th this I'm is how we become it. accidental lobbyists. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't ever want to be a lobbyist. I can tell you that. Just, just for the people. Just for the people. Just for the people. That's right. I am a voice for the people. You know, being, I was 18 when I had my first child. You know, I had three kids by the time I was 25. I had no education. There is no programs. You know, people think, oh, welfare queens just sit out there making checks and making babies. But that's not how it was. Clinton implemented a five year moratorium, you no know, more than five years in a lifetime. Well, I raised three kids and I only used 18 months of TANF in all 18 years of raising my kids. I was a hard worker. You know, if I had to work at the gas station at the corner store, I did. It, you know, I worked for an oil company for 10 years that ironically went out of business after 125 years. But I didn't have health care. I didn't have benefits. You know, I had a 401k that they ripped off in 2008 in the last crisis, yep. you know, crisis. So. I had nothing, you know, it's not like I felt empowered to be out there even talking about my problems. Who am I to talk about uh, what's going on in our country? I'm just white trash trailer park, you know, but I see those people stand in the food bank line next to me who don't have health care, who don't have dental. And, you know, people we fight for health care, but so many people need dental. Dental is killing people. That's another one that just fries me. We are America and we can't fix people's teeth. You know, oh, the richest country in the history of the world. And we can't even take care of the people. You know, we know that uh, we're going to be judged by how we uh, protect and, and care for the most vulnerable among us. And, and we just shun them. We leave them. And, you know, we've all seen the homeless problem growing for the last 10 years. You know, these are direct results of the neoliberal policies. The problem is, is we have a, a Democratic Party that's too much like the Republican Party. And, and so they're just the corporate party and, and the people lose out. We're losing out. We see it over and over, especially with these stimuluses. Pro promise a lot, deliver nothing. 
Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, th that's what empowered me was the person next door to me saying, thank you, Shanda. Thank you for standing up and fighting for that. Here's $20 for gas if you want to go to the Capitol and, and fight for universal health care. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, OK. Then I felt obligated like, this. OK, I got to go fight for this person because they got to go to work and I got the time to go. So <laughs> that's how I just kind of kept going and going and going. And now it's just we can't turn back it's not going to get better if we just go back to sleep, right? No, we can't, we can't turn back. And like I've said before on multiple shows, this is the last ship I'm sailing. I'm, I'm that blue haired or should I say bald haired boomer you guys are <laughs> referring to, but I am so in tune with, you know, the millennials and the Z years and everybody, because my mind hasn't been corrupted by the bullshit they've been shoving down our throat through mainstream media for years and years and years. Critical thinking skills are, are coming back to a lot of us. And this is this is where we get right. the evolution of the Ambers and the Shondas and, and and the rest of the people around many in this group right here. We got you got Pat, you got uh you got uh Jilly, you got Melissa, you got Trev, you got Brom, you got Chelsea. I mean, these are all real people and they care about things. So, yeah, um Sharon and Sharon, Jeffrey every, and Sharon, yeah, there's just too many and and Hi to everybody. Thank you so much for yes. coming in, supporting our show. Shanda, we've got slide 17. Who is this uh, this gentleman in this bed right here? This is my number one issue. This is my husband, Al. And this was um, not even five months ago. So, you know, I got into the fight for uh, Medicare for all because my husband is a diagnosed diabetic. He was diagnosed in 2012, but he was in one of those donut holes where if you work, you can't get the Apple health care because we do have a little bit of a safety net in Washington state, but he made too much money to qualify for that. And he made too much money to qualify for the free clinic. So basically we were having to pay out thousands of dollars a month for his insulin. Well, we did that for the first year or two and we tried to control it with diet, but he finally just got to a point where he was like, screw it. You know, we can't afford it. He feels like crap every day anyway, so I'm just not going to take it. And, you know, Halloween night, we were supposed to go trick or treating with the grandkids and, and he said, well, I have a stomach flu. He kept throwing up. And I had a Bernie rally the next morning or a, a big Bernie event. At, like I was going to get up at five and leave. And so I was like, well, I'm tired. I don't want to take you to the hospital. Why don't you have your mom take you? And it was about 11 o'clock at night and my phone rings and it's his mom. And she says he's having a massive heart attack. He's leaving by ambulance to Seattle at the time. I thought he was going to Seattle and I hear the ambulance going by as she's calling me. And I just he's 43 years old. What do you mean he's having a massive heart attack? You know, no, he has the flu, you know. And so I jumped in the car. I drove to the hospital. When I got there, he was already in procedure. They were putting in two stints. This was about two weeks after Bernie had his stint put in. So I was okay with that, you know, like, okay, well, Bernie came through it okay. So, you know, and the next day the doctors informed us that he was going to have to have a double bypass because of years of going without insulin damaged his heart. His heart muscle was only functioning at a very small percentage, like 30%. Um, he had multiple problems with it. So he spent almost 20 days in the hospital. I, and a lot of that was me getting him out of there earlier. He probably would have stayed a lot longer, but, uh, I was, I was helping. I was getting him out of the hospital, getting him home and getting him rehabilitated. He was too young to have to suffer from this. So of course, instantly, as soon as he had his heart attack, he, um, and now he qualifies for medical, <laughs> you know? So, but now the fight for disability has started and in light of COVID, we don't know when we're going to see that, but that's where we're at. So basically the one issue that I had been fighting the hardest for, because I knew people in our country were dying came and slapped me right in the face. It came home to roost. And so I, I personally firsthand know how people are dying in this country because these damn pigs won't give them health care. I mean, even now we're not talking about health care in the middle of a damn pandemic. You know, what do they say? 43 million Americans are set to lose their insurance because of this pandemic. And they're not even talking about health care. Joe Biden says, well, if you get COVID, we'll treat you. OK, well, what if you get a heart attack? F off and die then? I mean, that makes no sense to me. And, and so this is this is my little like, you know, 
part of me that I'm giving to you guys. It's the hardest thing I had to go through in the last, you know, years. It, it's heartbreaking to love somebody and to watch them suffer because they can't afford their medicine. It's got to end. There's nothing, there's nothing about access or affordable that has anything to do with the basic human right of health care. So anytime you see those words, access and affordable, whoever's speaking them, just uh, consider them part of the problem. Uh, we, need, right. we need Medicare for all nationally. I say internationally in Washington State, whole Washington. You guys are busting your ass for that. We're all doing it for situations just like yours. You're not unique with Al. I, I'm so sorry you had to go through that, but we're glad that he's made it to the point he is and he's getting better, right? He is getting better. He's getting stronger every day. Uh, they had to harvest two arteries from him. So they took an artery out of his arm. They took an artery out of his entire leg. Oh, my God. He has a lot of nerve damage in his arm. So he's constantly in pain from that. But we're hoping as he heals, it, it will get better. You know, he tells me I'm a young man trapped in an old man's body now because who thinks they're going to have their chest cracked at 43? You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's 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 scary as hell. That is scary and as hell. Did you guys know that um, when insulin was discovered in the 1920s that the inventor refused to put free. his name on the patent? Yeah, he gave it to the people for yeah. free. So why are we paying $780 for a bottle of insulin? Yeah, it was 30. Th I was a pharmacy technician in 1996 and it was $33.99. The cost, the cost, get this, the cost, the cost was somewhere around $3. Uh my God, you know, yeah, me, I mean, they've just been profiting hand yeah. over fist since then. I don't think there's one real price of anything in the healthcare industry. Come on. I mean, if you go yeah, watch it and yeah, look at an itemized report price, from a yeah. hospital, they'll charge you twenty five dollars for a little tiny box of napkins. You know, Yeah, it's 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 again. Um, it's you have this one slide here. You want to. Tell yeah. Us about so this that? is my. Oh, I probably should have brought it up to where I could actually read it. I'm going to try to bring it up to where I can see it. You want me to read it for you? Yeah, if you could, because I can't see it. I'm blind as a bat. Well, I just learned how to read yesterday. I'm still not good <laughs> at it. Being, uh, I think it's being an, ac an activist is a heartbreaking job. Your friends make fun of you. You and your family will shun you. Sometimes you may even lose your spouse. You spend money you do not have and never make a dime. You fight constant propaganda, teaching people that don't care. You can lose your job, money, sanity, and even your life. You are often hated and almost never appreciated. Sometimes all your efforts feel like a waste of time. But if it's your calling... None of these things will stop you because people like, like you, you change, change the, the world. world. And, that, and that people like you change the world. And that's the most important thing I, I want to kind of end our show with. I, I want to explain the format that we are going to go with in the future. Um, we I'm, we're looking for those people in the movement that are fighting, that are, you know, creating something from nothing, that are putting themselves out there. We know so many of them. I mean, the list goes on and on. But I think the most important thing is to get their stories out there, get the issues that they're fighting for out there. And, and you know, if you guys want to contact us, we're going to have you can contact me at the serious blonde at gmail.com. Or you can send it to Uphill Media. You can reach out to us individually. Just if you've got an idea or you know somebody that you think we need to talk to, reach out to us. Let us know who they are because, you know, it's up to us. It's up to us. It is. It's it's up to us. Um now, we've got an outro song that we're going to play in the entirety. Um, you want to talk quickly about that or briefly? I'm excited about this yeah, song. Yeah, this is... This this, song. Yeah, why don't you... Uh, I, I actually introduced this song to Shanda, and she fell in love with it, and I wasn't going to give it up to just anybody. <laughs> I wanted somebody to take this song um, as special as I did. So, Shanda, just tell everybody about this song and how it's... how it made you feel like you were free to go forward with your life well tell me again who the artist is it's michelle contreras contreras okay yeah. michelle contreras um 
I want I want to say she's from the Netherlands. Netherlands, yeah. And this was a song from the Eurovision 2001 Spring Festival. Yes, and it is absolutely beautiful. And, and it's about coming out of, you know, your life, all of the things that you, you were and, and breaking free and becoming free to be who I am. And, you know, I never thought that I would be here. I never thought I'd be sitting in front of a screen talking to people about my experiences and leaving the Democratic Party and becoming free now to fight for all of our platform, for to fight for all of our things, you know, this song just sets me free. Well, I am glad that you've treated this song with the respect and dignity that I think it deserves. Our passions around our artisan works and music through music, Sharon Abreu, she, she, she does so much wonderful work through music. Amber, talk about the artisans, um, you know, how you feel about this as well. Well, it, it really is a culmination of a lot of different feelings and, you know, we all kind of go through, I like to say it's like, you know, the five stages of grief through things. And, you know, we, one, one of the best things that we have been able to gain from this movement, from the people that I've met is this lasting family. And yes. it's the thing they didn't expect in 2020 and 2019 that we have all maintained this connection and this connection is tight and nothing's going to break it. It's getting and tighter. Yeah, it's tighter. It's tighter. It's worldwide. If I need 20 bucks for gas, I know I can get 20 bucks for gas. We will throw down for each other at any moment. And that cannot be said for many things happening, right, especially right now in the United States. No, and it, it is. This, this song is like a culmination of that to me. It's that, you know, when you have that big of a safety net, that you really can be free and and do what you need to do and not be in fear anymore and that is a huge gift it so. is a huge gift it is so freeing oz thank you so much for giving me this song and helping me find my creative freedom amber thank you so much you it's very rare i find another woman who runs at the same level as me you know just like we've got to tackle everything thank you so much for everything that you do and thank you to everybody in the chat you guys have been amazing tonight all of our i will get better about reading the chat and and getting back with you guys as we go through the shows you know i will get better they always say your first two shows out are your roughest i know i will get a little bit stronger and uh you can go ahead and roll it, Oz. Thank you. And again, I'm I'm honored to be able to work with you and uh, start your 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 journey through social media with the accidental activist. And uh, I hope everybody enjoys this as much as I do. And hit the like button. Donate to Uphill Media. Now is the time to spread my wings